stick most in your mind? What was most memorable about the two or so hours we spent this morning before lunch? When I saw the kids out on lunch, I felt like I could feel a little bit what a couple felt like maybe on an occasion after that exercise. Oh, yeah. 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 Sensory yeah. issues that they might be experiencing. And that's one good thing about the lunchroom is that it's not like a typical grade school lunchroom uh, where the noise levels are so loud, it's so high, that if OSHA came in, uh, the school would get a citation or a fine for having too noisy a workplace. <laughs> so that's, uh, that certainly helps. Now, uh, what else from this morning is memorable? You know, I remember you mentioning people having uh, uh, when they get like a heightened sense of anxiety that their peripheral vision will be a lot better. Uh huh. And it's something that I'm related to in the students I have right now. Oh, okay. When he gets, I, I don't know, it's stuck with me, but when he gets very anxious, like, his eyes will go all over the place, then he'll have more difficult behaviors after that. Mm hmm. Right. And if your eyes are moving around all over the place, it's kind of hard, it's hard to get useful information from the environment. Well, uh, what else about this morning? Just the fact that the, with the changes that are coming, it's weird to think, well, there's no such, like, Asperger's has, has disappeared. Isn't that weird? Yeah. You know, like five years from now, people, what the, you know, that's, a, that's big. Yeah, that is big. I mean, the, the name will stick around for a while. As people remember it, and people with an Asperger diagnosis will still have an Asperger diagnosis. Or yeah. More accurately, they will be folded into autism spectrum disorder. Uh, however, if upon rediagnosis, uh, they end up uh, falling under a social communication disorder, then that's where they're going to end up. So no one's going to lose a diagnosis in the process, but it is possible that there'll be a change or perhaps a loss of diagnosis when the person is reevaluated. That's when it might occur. So does anybody have any questions about last about this morning? Anything you want more information on? Anything that's confusing? Yes. Tend to change over time, like you overcome one sensory experience, but then all of a sudden a different one emerges. Research that kind of stays consistent throughout. For instance, we had a child, one case in point is a child who wouldn't step on the grass out here, just wouldn't. Right. And we experience, well, that's a sensory violation. Mm -hmm. And kind of desensitized him to it through a number of activities and took his mind up where it was. Mm -hmm. And in time, there was no issue at all. Running around the grass was no issue. And all of a sudden, it's something else. Mm -hmm. um, that he seems totally free to walk through the door. But that was no issue. I've always wanted to walk once over time. Well, the sen sensory profiles do change over time. So they can be variable. So, for example, as a child, haircuts were just impossible for me. And it wasn't the light touch, it wasn't the buzzing of the scissors. Uh, it wasn't the strange smells from barbershop because haircuts were done at home. But what it was is that when hair gets cut, each strand gets a little tug along the way. And some of us feel that more than others. And I didn't have the verbal ability to tell my parents in a way that, that they could understand that that was a problem. And at this time, haircuts are not a problem. So you will see changes uh, in the sensory profile, certain things will be hyper or hypo in terms of receptivity, and they may flip, or other senses may become involved that you didn't expect, or that you didn't see before. So there is variability. So that's a good question. Just on that, some, yeah. some students could have <laughs> you know, one or the other, so it's hyper or hypo, they got mixed. Well, definitely be mixed. Yeah, they're very sensitive to other things. They need a lot more sensory input moving forward. Right. So they may be hyper sensitive to visual or auditory input, hypo sensitive to proprioceptive and vestibular. 
Ja, schon, dann ist mit dir Max. Yeah. On the question of DSM-5, mm-hmm. and this is a work in progress, so it's hard to know exactly how well this is going to work, and particularly at the beginning, but there is an intention to rely on more intensive assessment of each child to make this work, and to look at needs and strengths much more closely. So as to really develop a much better profile of each child within the autism spectrum. And then to discuss as a profile of what each child's needs and strengths are within the spectrum and do a description of the needs and strengths and develop a program based on that. And so each child would then be individually placed within that based on their needs and strengths, rather than classifying them by giving them a label, rather than calling them Asperger, PDD, NOS, classical autism, and so on. So that would then fit better Mm-hmm. in a sense for each child, if it works the way it's designed to work based on knowing each child better. Well, so we'll see if that right. works the way it's intended to. Well, with every change, there'll be positives and negatives, and positives you just described. Uh, if people are going to make the efforts in which to develop a true profile of the individual, as opposed to relying on subtypes, which uh, sometimes we do a little bit too much and get hardening of the categories, you might say. And, uh, then it will work well. So if we don't drop kids off the end of it and don't provide services, it, it'll work the way it's intended. So, so we'll, we'll, te- te- we'll have to see. Time will tell. Will tests have to change or no? If, so, so here's part of the tricky thing is that when, when you look at the, ra- the ratings is how some of these tests work anyway, the data seems to show that none of these tests right. work particularly well as tests. Right. <laughs> and that really a lot of this is good clinical judgment and the perspicacity of the people who are knowing these kids and making the determination. The clinicians, the psychiatrists, the neurologists, the the people who are really spending time with the child, the educators, and and looking at and saying how these kids are functioning and what the needs and strengths are the parents, you know, self taking this all into account. Right. Yeah. So if we do a good assessment of that individual, uh, then the DSM will have done what it's and so the fact that they're including sensory and including mm-hmm. the, the prescription to do a multimodal assessment, including biological factors, including sensory factors, including these other things, and, and saying this is what you should do is hard thing. Because they're taking an approach that is much more inclusive than the old DSM-14. Stephen. Yeah. Maybe so. I remember studying um, in physics. If you look at a distant galaxy, you get a spectral analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, you can tell if it's moving away or what kind of components are in there based on the spectrum. <laughs> I often think of the children here, like you could probably have a set of heads. The kids you feel like the pure, pure the kid, right. to the kids, and that would be a pure rainbow spectrum, much respect, uh-huh. versus the kids that might have a choppy presentation. Autism would be like the spectral analysis from looking at it. Just the gaps, you see just the little lines and rainbows. Mm-hmm. And it's always, you know, I always have that in my mind, yeah. an image that, oh, well, this guy, like we do intake interviews or traditions. Well, this, this is the pure. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is, mm, not quite sure. Right. And it's always, so it sounds like this type of diagnosing of children based on their needs and functions wouldn't be looking so much for the pure kid, the natural formula but to the pure kid. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, the only formula that exists, the only formula there is, is that there is no formula. Right. <laughs> so you really have to go in, or the formula might be uh, 
certain way that you do assessments. Well, the teaching here, who I have time to say, for the veteran teachers here who did a type of daily life therapy that we were trained in 15, 20 years ago, you got one of these pure kids. Within two weeks, you yeah. just did jogging, you just did basic postures, just did structure routine, they're on board. Mm -hmm. And the, the kids who are not so you know, pure, we're not on board. They're right. an additional support, a three peak place, an additional behavior camp, additional bonding, support in the class. So we used to say, if you only took the kids that were pure, daily life therapy would, would be the formula mm -hmm. for that subset of the population. Right. And then you get to the point. Only accept that subset. No one has to make a super effort. Just apply the formula that works. Then you have a much smaller school. <laughs> <laughs> right. We also bring up an important point, and that is what you what you've done is you've identified at least one subset and one subtype, and there are approaches uh, that do do that. Uh, floor time, for example, has four subtypes. And depending upon the subtype of the individual, these are certain things that you do. Uh, the Miller method has two subtypes. And depending upon the subtype, uh, which is characteristic based, I guess they would all have to be. Um, but there are certain things you do. So, for example, in the Miller method, they talk about closed system children and system forming children. And the closed system child is maybe talking about in terms of cure. This is what most of us think of as autism. A child who's overly involved in routines. This is a child who will make sure that that door is closed and every other door is closed. Uh, that door over there to that cabinet is open just a little bit. And nobody here will notice it uh, the next point over. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but he will notice it. And he's going to make sure that that's closed. You interrupt a routine, uh, you're going to hear about it. That's right. <laughs> yep. And that's what we often think about as a child with autism. But the other type, uh, which Miller practitioners refer to as system forming disorder, uh, this is the child with autism uh, with a dose of ADHD. So this is the child who you would bring into this room. They wouldn't notice the state of the doors. But the first thing they do is they uh, they gravitate towards the first shiny object uh, that comes within their field of view. So they come to it, they might touch it, they might pick it up, within half a second they're off to something else, and it's like they have a little motor in them, and they're just running all the time, and not, they're orienting to just about everything in the environment, but they're not engaging in anything. A real short attention span. And that's another type of child uh, with autism. And uh, you would develop intervention very differently uh, for both of them. So that's something that we're getting into. It's coming out from another direction. So the subtypes can be helpful as long as you don't get hardening of the categories, you might <laughs> say. And understand that children, rather than being specifically or purely in a particular subtype, uh, often will be predominantly in one subtype pieces of it. So then that gets back to the idea that Anne was talking about, the importance of doing a really good, getting a really good profile. Exactly what that individual needs. So you can go around in circles with this. And I think the thing to do is to do whatever best helps you understand the needs of that child. Uh, however you do that, where you put them in groups, where you talk about Consider severity levels, or whatever it might be. And here we see the DSM people, the committee, getting away from the subtypes and just moving to severity levels and the idea that you really need to do a good clinical assessment of that individual. So that's good, that was a good thing. I'm not who's responsible for being that. Oh, let's blame it again. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good that you brought that up. Important to consider. So as we look at sensory issues, as we look at what everybody does on the spectrum, <coughs> I was hoping to adulthood. We spend 70 to 80% of our lives 
than adults. And the question is, what are we doing now to prepare for a successful transition to adulthood? Preparing for a successful transition to adulthood, you know, we might have an example such as this. It could be a high school setting, it could be a college setting. And it could be a situation where a test is being taken, and it's in a quiet room. However, if this person has sensory issues, what are some things about the room that may prove to be a sensory overload or take away from the ability to be successful in this test? <coughs> in other words, what sounds in the background may not be in the background? All right, so the scratching of pencils is the writing on the paper. What other sounds? Pretty tapping. All right, tapping, nervous tapping. What else? Sounds about the rooms or mechanical sounds. Mechanical sounds, sound of ventilators, uh, chairs moving, sound of people walking. Ever notice when people walk that their pants make a sort of swishing sound, especially if they're wearing corduroys? Well, maybe now you will, but it's time to, it's time to walk. So it's these sounds that we can effectively put in the background that these people may not be able to. And it can be sort of like watching TV with all the stations on at once, instead of just one at a time, which is what most of us do. We concentrate on one thing at a time. We may switch our concentration from one thing to another very rapidly, but still one thing at a time. A <coughs> person with autism has all the stations on at the same time. And that will create sensory overload. And then there are the sounds that you can't hear, but they can hear. I know people with autism who can hear electricity running in the walls. It's like cats. Or have a hypersensitive scent of smell. Of smell. So sensory issues are important in adulthood. Sensory issues play a large role in relationships, for example. I have a friend on the spectrum who desperately wants to date, but she is not able to tolerate holding somebody's hand. So that could be challenging. So how is she going to deal with this situation? What type of disclosure might she have to make? And sensory issues in relationships uh, also play a part in hygiene. How many of you know people on the spectrum have difficulty with hygiene? stay away from any soap that has a greater than one-to-one -one scrub ratio. <laughs> I've seen situations where uh, soap has had five-to-one scrub ratios. They spend five minutes doing the lathering thing and then spend 25 minutes scrubbing the thing off. Oh, so it's off right away. No, that's good. 
Yeah, so what I do is I bring in my own soap that Dr. Broder's going to sit And that stuff you can rinse off. Uh, you don't even have to scrub it off. As long as you stand underwater, then it will pretty much come yeah. off. And maybe dials like that too. Yeah. I have a question. But over time, are you able to adjust to it? So say you didn't have your soap with you. Right. And say I didn't have my special hair or whatever gel. Are you able to adjust if you practice that before? It is, and just some things it's possible to adjust to. So the scrub ratio thing is, I would say, somewhere between sensory issues and convenience. Uh, the sensory issue component is maybe I sense the film more than other people. Uh, the convenience component is I don't want to spend 25 minutes after soaking up. Scrubbing the thing off. And the same maybe uh, with other types of uh, cleaning agents for your hair and so on. Uh, so it is possible, it can be possible to adjust. Somebody who has more tactile sensitivity than I do may just not be able to tolerate that film of soap. And then it becomes impossible. So it really depends on the individual. And as we think about intimate relationships, uh, there's a lot of sensory stuff that goes on there. There may be people who are hyper or hyposensitive to various sensations. Uh, a friend of mine told me that she being hyposensitive uh, needs to be, uh, for lack of better terminology, she's the one who came up with the terminology, she needs to be knocked around when she's having sex. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you know, if uh, her partner is not understanding of that, then that could cause all kinds of problems. So the sensories play an important role in just about everything we do. I do. I have one question. Yeah. That I think, at least for me, here it's such a hard line to draw. Where you know we have a new student that comes in, and the parents are you know, very concerned. Well, he's very sensitive to noise. And we're like, turn the radio off, you know. So we want to try to desensitize, but where's the, you know, especially our population is mostly nonverbal students. Right. Where, when do you stop saying, okay, it's been eight years and he's still holding his ears every time he goes in the gym. Maybe it's not desensitizing. He really actually does have a sensory issue with it. Because we mm -hmm. tend to be, or at least I'll say I tend to be, more on the opposite side. We're going to fight through it. We're going to teach you to not be sensitive to these issues. And so it's kind of kind of a hard balance to be sensitive to their issues, but not right. so sensitive that you don't challenge them to overcome things that we feel that they should be well, able to very, overcome. Well, it's a very, it's a very uh, important question. And it's individualistic uh, yeah. to each student. Uh, sensory issues are a neurological, uh, neurological in nature. <clears throat> and there are some things that you can change neurologically. Uh, sensitivities to some sort, and you may be able to uh, desensitize someone to auditory input, such as what is happening in the gym. Some students will be able to desensitize a lot. Uh, others, uh, you'll be challenged to figure out a way to desensitize them even a little bit. So uh, it gets back to the idea of getting to know your student, to bonding with your student, and to know when this is they learn to behavior because it's been so uncomfortable going into a noisy place, and breaking through that, and whether it's really a sensory violation. Then if it is, what can you do to help balance out the senses uh, to reduce that sensory issue? So that, that is an important question. When do you push and how far do you push? Uh, at the extreme ends of neurological type, uh, you can't desensitize yourself out of uh, uh, kicking your leg when the doctor bangs the hammer against your knee to see if you have a reflex. It's just going to happen. And at the extreme ends, there can be sensory situations, but that just does happen. And there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, so I'll come up with an example once we answer your question. Um, this is a little bit of a similar issue. I was speaking with a researcher summer who um, was a, I think a neurologist. Mm -hmm. He had this interesting theory of sensory um, process. He's 
isn't well. We're all aphids anyway, but no, it isn't no. diagnostically on the spectrum. And what does aphids stand for? This autistic person have what do you call it? That's a type two, right? <laughs> Type one is autistic paratypal. Uh, yeah, we have many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, he was saying his you know, the theory he was teasing was that he found that a lot of the students' behaviors might not necessarily be sensory in nature, but they may uh, be related to the insistence on sameness. Uh -huh. He was saying perhaps a child isn't actually perceiving the fluctuations of the, of the fluorescent ball. But at home, he has an incandescent ball. Mm -hmm. So it's different. Therefore, he's upset. Right. Not necessarily sensory reliable, but upset with the change. In the sensory input. Yeah. Right. So where, that's an interesting. That's an interesting dimension to yeah. consider. The, the difference in sensory input uh, may be difficult. And if that's something that you can determine or suspect, uh, one way to handle that might be to have a sort of, some sort of transition plan. Essentially, uh, uh, educating the student and communicating to the student that at home we have this type of lighting, and at school we have this other type of lighting, and this is what these feel like. Uh, one's not better than the other, but they're just different. So, if you have a way to help them prepare for the change, that can be helpful. And that goes for anything, whether it's a sense of an oncoming sensory <coughs> or an activity or anything else. So that was, a, yeah, that was a, that's a good thing to point out. Well, speaking of sensory issues, uh, let us suppose we have a situation where uh, you have a student who's in the middle of the line, lining up before going out for recess or leaving the classroom, and they always seem to be hitting other students. So you look a little bit more closely, and you find that perhaps the student has tactile sensitivity. So to them, uh, what it feels like to them when someone else's coat or bag or arm brushes against them, it may feel like a slap or punch. And what do most people do if they get slapped or punched unexpectedly? <laughs> You're going to reciprocate and then ask questions later. <laughs> So it's sort of a reflex. And if we look at the neurology of the <coughs> reflex, we need to think of ways of how we can help this particular student. And we have all kinds of uh, tools. We can develop all kinds of accommodations. So for example, with such a student, I might ask them if they want to be the line monitor. One of the jobs of the line monitor is to hold the door open for the line. And when everybody passes through, she gets in at the back of the line, which is exactly where she should be, because then she can visually monitor how close she is to the other people. But as we deal with the issue of striking back, uh, might it be possible to use social story, power card, another social narrative, or a visual schedule to keep her from striking back when she's unexpectedly touched? How many people would vote for being able to do that? One, two, three. I think it might be impossible because it's a neurological reaction. But how many of you could be social storyized out of um, jumping back after unexpectedly touching the hot stove? You couldn't do it. You just can't do it. But what you can do is you can educate her in understanding that getting into tight quarters is just not a good thing for her to do, it's uncomfortable, and then all of those tools I mentioned could be used to educate her to stay at her back of lines or to stay out of crowds, or basically just to get out of situations uh, where she might have a problem, and then it might be healthy. So, adulthood. Made it to college, it was a utopia. I have more friends. If I want to ride my bicycle at midnight, I can find someone just as strange as I was to also ride at midnight. <laughs> also, uh, dating occurs in college. 
Uh, there's a whole area of sensory issues, a whole area of hidden curriculum, and unspoken rules. I remember my first encounter after spending a lot of time with this lady. She suddenly told me that she really likes hugs and backwards. What I thought was, gee, I've got this brand new friend. And in addition, she doubles as a deep pressure temple grade and squeeze machine. <laughs> being hyposensitive, being sensory seeking. But I guess she had other ideas. <laughs> and after a lot of conversation, I slowly realized that in addition to wanting to be my girlfriend, she thought we had been dating for about a month. So that made me realize that I had to do some research in this area. Spend hours in stores reading books on body language, dating, dating for dummies, and things like that. <laughs> and just the sheer volume of these books made me realize that this might be challenging for a lot of people. So maybe all these books aren't written for people with autism. So by the time I got to grad school, I had a little more knowledge. And after spending a lot of time with this lady, first checking each other's homework, we met in a music class, so there's a common special interest. But then morphed over to doing things socially. And then one day at a beach, very much like this, she suddenly gave me a kiss, a hug, and held my hand. By then, I had the social story down. It went something like this. If a woman hugs you, kisses you, and holds your hand all at about the same time, probably means they want to be a girlfriend. If that's the case, you better have an answer right away. It could either be yes, it could be no, or it could be further investigation and analysis as indicated. <laughs> so it seemed to be a good thing to do. And we've been married for 22 and a half years. So it's more of what she has to say on, I might say, her side of the autism spectrum and her contributions to my autobiography. So in <laughs> considering the situation, it also addresses something that I observed starting from when I was in grade school. That is, I was always curious as to why all of my friends were older than I was. Now when I got out into the world of work, why is it that all of my friends seem to be from other cultures? And I think it's, there is a cultural answer to that. That is, the people of a given culture are intimately aware of how you're supposed to behave. We behave differently. Uh, in grade school, it, it, um, it, it, you end up being bullied. As an adult, not many people want to have much to do with you. Uh, so one, it's awareness of un 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 hidden curriculum, unspoken rules, or lack of awareness, I should say. And then number two, People from another culture don't pick up uh, as many differences. Or maybe they just attribute those differences to culture. Though so I guess every American flaps their hands when they balance their spreadsheets. <laughs> and thirdly, people from another culture may have their own challenges integrating into society, so they may be more appreciative or tolerant of differences. And research has shown that the most successful long-term relationship with people on the autism spectrum tend to be with people, others who have differences. Maybe cultural, maybe neurocognitive, maybe racial, maybe age, or it might be something else. So it's an interesting thing to know. And also the fact that many people on the spectrum uh, become more successful when they move to another country. Because then all the social mistakes get attributed or misattributed to being from a different culture. Slide. So it's an interesting uh, dimension to consider. So moving on, I'm going to take a look at some different approaches. And we're going to contrast them. <coughs> now what we're looking at here is my dissertation. Because I realized in my doctoral program that there were a number of different approaches. Uh, people tended to get stuck in those approaches to the exclusion of others, and at times to the detriment of children of the autism spectrum. And as people would kind of uh, 
get involved in their approach and then trash all the others. But I thought, well, gee, isn't there, isn't there a way to compare these approaches? And I found that there was almost no research on comparative approaches. What little research existed set out to prove that one approach was better than another. And to this end, I think of a study in 2010 uh, was uh, developed by some ABA practitioners, and the title was Applied Behavior Analysis as Contrasted to Eclectic Approaches. So right away, you know who's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> it made me realize that this was not the way to be looking at approaches. The way to be looking at approaches uh, would be to get a good understanding of the different approaches and see where their salient points are, their strengths are, and then see what we can do to match practice to the needs of individuals with autism. So that we can say um, it's perfectly fine to specialize in one or two approaches. You can't master them all, but certainly have enough awareness of the others to be able to say, well, this isn't working. I'm going to try this technique from another approach, or maybe even refer the child to someone who practices this other approach. So that's where my research is um, um, examining different approaches. And that's some of the work that I'm doing with Autism Brainstorm, uh, people who are uh, recording and streaming this live to YouTube, uh, where we are looking at different approaches. And eventually, we want to get to a point. Uh, where we can look at a school and say, well, I think uh, this approach will seem to work pretty well with you, and let's find people who are practicing this approach and see what we can, see what can be done. So these are the five approaches that I examined. And it would have been nice to do a match group study, taking a match groups, say 10, each of these groups, uh, give them a certain amount of time, maybe six months, of a certain approach. Let's see what happens. And when you have matched groups, what else do you need? One more group. You need a control group. What do you do with the control group? <laughs> Nothing. So, are there any ethical issues <coughs> with withholding? intervention for six months. <laughs> so that might be part of the reason why you know, that study doesn't exist. <laughs> but what I could do is if in this particular point in time, I could interview people who had developed these approaches or were pretty close to developing these approaches and ask them how they thought about children with autism. I could ask them how they thought about the DSM, various other questions. So, I started with Ivra Lovas of ABA. He's the one who started that. Uh, soon he referred me to a student. I went to Gary Mezeboff of T who called Found and Teach. Uh, Kio Kibihara uh, passed away, but we had Anne over here. And I can certainly interview her. And with the Miller Method, Arnold Miller was alive, so I could talk with him. So we you know we co-founded four times. And I came up with some interesting findings. Uh, one was is that they all agreed that the descriptors of autism in DSM didn't fully describe what autism was. That was interesting. However, none of them could agree on what autism is. So if we don't have common agreement as to what autism is, then maybe that's going to cause some problems. Uh, I also uh, uh, found for most of them, four out of, four out of five, uh, agreed that people with autism had something to contribute to society and shouldn't be involved in curing or eliminating autism but more working with autism. But these are some interesting findings. There's certainly other approaches out there, but the dissertation had to be finished in my lifetime. <laughs> I just stuck with those five. And where do you find this information? You can type autism into Google and get 17 million hits. Uh, I found there needed to be one source, and so I put it in here. And I guess just the best thing to say is that I'm the dummy who wrote autism for dummies. <laughs> and 
that way, practitioner or parent or somebody who's looking to support an individual on the autism spectrum can go in and they can look at the different approaches and say, well, this one seems pretty good. Really like therapy, seems to answer my needs. I'm going to go to the Higashi website. Uh, it still looks interesting. <laughs> Check it out. Somebody else is going to say, well, I think ABA suits our needs more, so I'm going to go buy the ABA books and check that out. And having information about different approaches easily accessible uh, I feel is important. So we're going to take a look at some of these approaches. We're going to take a look at live behavior analysis uh, to begin with. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. This is the education section, right? Yes. But uh, is there any adult service using these techniques? Any adults? Oh, that's a good question. Like these ones for the education, maybe kids can use it for school, education stuff. But uh, after they graduate, can, I have, can they have the same like, services or all that? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question and something that bears further explanation or exploration. And uh, with all the focus on school-aged children on the autism spectrum, now with the just about total drop-off in everything as an adult, uh, we see very, very little use in these approaches with adults. doesn't mean that it doesn't work. And I'm sure it does work. Uh, you may have to make it... Uh, age appropriate and contextually appropriate, but the, the pillars of daily life therapy are just as appropriate for adults as they are for kids. And it's just a matter of making it age appropriate. And that's what's being done in the adult housing uh, efforts here in Boston Higashi. And I think the same could be done for any approach. And it's just a matter of making it um, age appropriate. Yeah. Are they finding that adults are now being diagnosed with autism? Like, have they been kind of diagnosed with kids or students? Uh, yes, they are. Is there a bigger rate now? <coughs> it is, there is a bigger rate. There are more adults being diagnosed as well. And part of the reason is that people have a greater understanding of what autism is. And the way it usually happens is in adults, or we can even say, uh, teenager, anyone past the traditional diagnostic age, uh, you have someone who's always been a little quirky, you're not, too, you're, you're, not really, you're not really sure, so they're about as impure as they can get, as you were talking about, <laughs> but they've always managed to work through. Uh, you've always been able to figure out, even if it was a convoluted way to get them to understand uh, important things that they needed to learn. And then what happens is, as anybody, as we all get older, life tends to get more complex. And it may be that that powerful fortress of accommodations that you developed, and that have been working more or less, sometimes more, sometimes less, the whole thing just sort of collapses because the complexity of life overwhelms their ability to cope. So that's a good question. Yeah, that, that is happening, and it's happening more and more. And what it requires is taking a history and reaching back to what was going on as a younger person. So we are seeing that. Uh, one thing that we know is that autistic characteristics do have to be present as a young child. Uh, but what may happen is that we don't perceive them as autistic characteristics until much later. Uh, nobody suddenly develops autism at, say, age 40. Uh, you may suddenly realize at age 40 that all that has really been going on is autism. So, yeah, that's a good question. So here we're going to take a look at applied behavior analysis. It's a little documentary, and it shows um, at least one ABA classroom. And as you look at this, uh, think about uh, what are the what is focused on. <coughs> What is the uh, T 
teach her to focus on in terms of her discussion of applied behavior analysis. What techniques do you see being used? You know, what is important for this teacher in understanding and educating students? So let's check this out. Let's get the speakers to work. No, it doesn't seem to work. Well, let's see if we can get if we can get the computer loud enough for you to hear it. Nice music, anyways. <laughs> important in the ABA classroom? Data. data. Collecting data. Establishing a reinforcer. Alright. <laughs> so what is reinforcing to the student? And individual. It depends on the individual, right. So there's a lot of focus on that. What else did you see there? Individual. Structure. 
right? Instruction at the table, individual instruction. Did you see any uh, visual supports? All right, so there were visual supports uh, as well. So yeah. there's all interaction between the teacher and student. Okay, interaction between teachers and students. So these are some of the things that uh, you can see in the ABA classroom. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind is what ABA is and what ABA isn't. And a lot of people mistake this for ABA. And all this is is discrete trial training. It's taking apart a typical task and teaching little pieces and then putting it back together again. How many of you have done something like this? Taking a task. You know, what did you do? <coughs> you break it down to each step. Teach it. All right. You take it apart. You teach step by step, and you chain it back together. Now, this is just one part of ABA. ABA is more of a philosophy of looking at how to modify behavior using operant conditioning. It's a system of rewards and punishments. Not so much punishments these days, but uh, more ignoring behaviors that, 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 you don't want, that you don't want, you want to reduce. So here we have uh, looking at reinforcement and punishment. And all reinforcement means is that you're going to increase the probability the behavior will occur. Punishment means you're going to decrease the probability that the behavior occurs. And that's what those term, two terms mean. Then when you're dealing with positive and negative, positive means that you're adding something. So if something gets done and you get a reward. Or negative reinforcement, something gets taken away. So how many of you have had kids whine at you to do something. And they keep whining at you and finally you say, okay, just this time. Well, they're using negative reinforcement on you. You give them what they want, the whining goes away. And that's negative reinforcement. And similarly, we're trying to decrease behaviors. Do that in terms of positive and negative as well. So what is important, and I think this is uh, one of the gifts given to us by the Applied Behavior Analysis people, is the idea of a functional behavior assessment. So knowing your ABCs, how many of you have heard of the ABCs? Behavior. So I'm passing out a math worksheet, and everyone gets one, including John, and many he rips it up, and then he's walking around. How do they see? Uh, this happens about 50% of the time. Can't always predict when it will happen, but all I can say is probably about 50%, 50% probability. So a few weeks ago, it occurred on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. The following week, it was on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. The following week, it was the last three days of the week. So it's not always predictable. So as we think about this uh, very short example, uh, what is the antecedent? Math worksheet. Yeah, passing out the math worksheet, the behavior. Ripping it up. Ripping it up. And when we describe behaviors, uh, whether it's here, daily life therapy, whether it's any approach, you have to be able to explain it in an observable way and that other people can observe. So for example, the behavior uh, student bothers other people. That's too nebulous. I mean, how do you interpret that? The behavior has to be stated in a way that somebody else, any of you, could observe. So maybe that student who's bothering other people gets out of their seat and pokes them. So let's say that. Pokes other people. And now, Ann, anybody, any one of you, to observe how many times a student poked another student. And that's how behavior needs to be described. Uh, what about the consequence? Yes? 
can you just let them walk like on to just 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 observe and just you don't say anything about it? Open it depends what you want to do. Uh, if you want to count how many times a student pokes in a twenty minute class uh, so without intervention. And then let them do what? Well that's bothering the other person. Uh, so what's happening is, let's say, uh, uh, I have a student who's poking other people. Uh, yeah, it's bothersome. Uh, I have Ann observed from a, from a uh, one-way glass. And she says, yeah, well, the student's getting up and poking someone five times. And I have somebody else observe four times. And it's certainly not a behavior that you want to maintain. It's not something that you want the child to do, so you're going to have to come up with an alternate behavior and find some way to reduce the poking. So it's definitely something that you don't want to happen, but you need to find a way to reduce it. So getting back to the paper, what is the consequence? Depends what teacher did. Whatever. Whatever. He doesn't do whatever they did. He didn't tell us. That, doesn't do the worksheet, and you're getting at it. Uh, I think the best way to think about consequence is putting the word maintaining in front of it. So the consequence is you do that again, and you know, you're going to stay after school for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's your consequence. But really, what we're looking, what you're looking at in terms of consequence is what is it that keeps the behavior going? Whether it's the poking, whether it's ripping up pieces of paper, and it might be that. When John rips up the paper, uh, I get mad at him and I tell him to leave the room and go to timeout. Escape. Yeah, well, it's an escape in this case. So he rips up the paper and gets out of doing the math worksheet. And maybe he likes to go to timeout. It's quiet in there. So it's important to be aware of what the maintaining consequence is. And he maintains his self esteem as best he can. Yeah. <laughs> All kinds of things. So as we think about the antecedents, it's also important to be aware of the types of antecedents. And we can divide them into slow and fast triggers. And the slow triggers are the ones you can't see. But what they do is they increase the likelihood of the behavior. And for example, we might find out that on the days John rips up his paper, that's the day that his family doesn't have Fruit Loops for breakfast. John loves Fruit Loops. And sometimes they don't have Fruit Loops, at least they have Cheerios, but Cheerios aren't Fruit Loops. And that just sets them off. Mm -hmm. What that suggests is that you need to find out what's going on in the student's life outside the classroom. Did something happen on the bus? Did the student get bullied? Did something else happen? And you do that by communicating with other teachers and parents and others who are in the student's life. So it's important to separate the antecedents to fast triggers, and that's the one you can see giving you the paper. Slow triggers, what might have happened before? And it's important to look at beyond the specific behavior as well. Why is this happening? Uh, might it be that there's a curriculum mismatch? The way it's working, what's happening? is that John is actually very good at math. And he does the whole worksheet in his head in 10 seconds. Now the math sheet is done, and he's bored. What happens when a student is bored? Find something to do. They all find something else to do. Or maybe John has a math master um, addition yet, so why are we asking him to do multiplication? So there might be a curriculum mismatch. Uh, there might be a learning style mismatch. What I mean by that is, how many of you, uh, when you were in school, uh, the teacher would pass out some worksheet, say, follow the directions and do your worksheet. But how many of you might have gone to the teacher and say, I don't know what to do? How many of you have seen that? Which I thought was one of the most ridiculous things a teacher could say. Because, at least with me, if I knew what to do, I wouldn't be asking them. <laughs> I would say, go read the directions what they would say. That's the most common response. So finally, the teacher gets exasperated after a number of times and says, it says add up all the numbers. And the student says, oh, OK, and they do it. 
So what that means is that the student might be learning better auditorially, auditory-wise, than by the written word. So it's important to match learning style, not to cause a challenging behavior. Maybe there's a sensory issue in the room that's getting in the way. So these are all things that we need to consider. Maybe John has a food intolerance and this is happening after lunch and he's getting into something he shouldn't have gotten into. So the big question is why is this happening? And if we can answer why, then we have a good chance at resolving the issue. All right, here's another one, teach. Treatment and education of autistic and related communication handicapped children. Nobody can remember that. Let's call it teach. <laughs> Likewise with the ABA classroom, let's take a look at what some of the uh, similarities, differences are, and what seems to be the focus. <coughs> emphasized in the teach room, teach classroom. Very visual. It was very visual. So one of the aspects about teach is they like to work with the culture of autism. That's one thing they can say if you read about teach, mention of the culture of autism. And what that means is looking at the characteristics and the strengths of people with autism, which tends to be visual. So there will be a lot of visual. <coughs> teach is a combination was built off of a combination of the social sciences, the behavioral sciences, and cognitive sciences. And do you remember what they said about uh, different approaches? They can combine. Yeah, they could be combined. Right. So that's interesting. Pulling techniques from whatever approach seems to be appropriate. You can use it with technical tools as well. Yeah, you can. 
uh, here we have a teach workstation, typical teach workstation, uh, where everything is set up in such a way that it becomes clear as to what the task is, what needs to be done, usually going from left to right. So here's a task of folding envelopes and stacking them up in a bit. So as we think about teach, teach practitioners ask these five questions. And in particular, do students understand the answers to these five questions? And if they do, uh, then the student will be learning and you'll see fewer challenging behaviors. So where should the child be? When you're not clear with this, how many of you seen children wandering around the room? And it may be that they're not that clear as to exactly where they need to be. And that needs to be communicated. Sometimes repetitive questions can come from just not knowing what they need. They not knowing what needs to be done. How many of you have students refusing to start or end an activity? Transitioning in and out of activities. So how can we communicate to the student that it's time to end <coughs> or it's time to begin? And how do they know when they're done? And what's coming next? So preparing for transitions. And they do a lot of work, as you mentioned, with visual schedules, be it object, picture, or written, or a combination. And with these picture, with these schedules, some students will be able to tolerate. Um, will be able to tolerate just a two-part schedule. You're doing this now, and this is what is next. Others may be able to manage two or three or more activities, and some even a full day. So here's some examples of schedules. This is an object schedule. So the objects tell the student what the task is. There's another one. They use a lot of bids with teach. There's a combination picture and word schedule. Uh, it's probably an entire one. And here's another one, the word schedule. Good morning. A lot of clipboards get, get used as well. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of this approach. <laughs> so Jamie and I were on the way to Hong Kong to give a presentation at the International Agency of Special Education. And we're trying to figure out a way to visually represent daily life therapy in a way that was easy to, uh, for others to understand. And the best way, best way we could depict it was to think of a foundation of initial guidance, initial stage guidance, getting the student used to the school and to the routines of the school, and then working on the three pillars, as you see here beginning with physical activities. So regulating the body. Body has to be regulated before you can attend to emotional or intellect emotional regulation or intellectual stimulation. And that gets back to the idea of body to environmental relationships. If you don't know where your body is in relation to the environment, there's not much that you're going to be able to do. And the best way to figure out where your body is in relation to the environment uh, is to move. So starting the day running around the school is a good way to get that started. And we all know that when you exercise, get some good exercise during the day, you're going to sleep well at night. That works for kids on the autism spectrum. And there's a lot of supporting research. That gets to the idea of research. Supporting research that exercise improves sleep habits. I think there may even be some research suggesting that exercise reduces challenging behaviors. 
people with special needs, maybe even with autism. There will be research soon demonstrating the efficacy of exercise uh, here uh, at Boston Higashi. So yeah, we're going to work on that one too. Yeah, that's the next one. So what can we do to determine uh, the efficacy of exercise? Well, I have a small experiment. All right. Um, you can always, uh, you could, uh, like before jogging, students are lined up. All the PE teachers often will leave the jogging line. You could measure compliance. You could measure everybody touch your head. See how many kids are still focused. Well, keep eye contact. Head. Then you can jog two laps and do it again. See an increase in stillness. All right, so you got a repeated measures going on there. Uh, you study before the treatment, and you study the after after the treatment. So uh, that's one very simple way of looking at uh, the, the uh, effect of exercise. Now, how, how do you know the measures that compliance? Say that again. I think that would be like the effect of exercise on attention. Right. Now, what, what, what could we do to possibly eliminate the possibility of some confounding variables? Maybe it was something else, such as the teacher talking to the students or encouraging the students to move along rather than the exercise itself. How could we count or handle those variables? Experiments where you have two Okay. Alright, so jogging with or without prompts. Uh, maybe we could even have a group that doesn't jog. And let's see what happens at the beginning. And we should get, get a baseline of pretty similar behaviors. And then what about after the period of jogging? where half the students jogged and the other half didn't. And, uh, is there a difference in behaviors between those two groups? So these are some things that we could do. Well, to jog, we could do some activity in the morning, such as basic study, and jog after basic study or before basic study. So we have to have a class before jogging or after jogging. Right. And then switch that, say, second term. Uh-huh. All right, so that's another way to look at it. You have two groups. One group where the jogging occurs before basic study, uh, the other group where the jogging occurs afterwards, and then you flip it. It's difficult. I mean, when I think of that, like one of the statements you often hear is one person on the spectrum, one person on the spectrum. The variabilities in our students' behaviors and doing group study like that, two subgroups, uh -huh. I was fine with that. Two different right. tasks. Yeah, I think I initially feel that so many different variables with students' characteristics. Well, how they be so different from each other, you wouldn't get comparable analysis. Right. Unless you set up, I think we were talking before, a specific or sometimes um, presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you stay me once here, or whatever one's here, and whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, and even the idea of spending uh, one semester. Uh, uh, jogging before and the other semester jogging after, flipping them. Uh, what about the variable of maturation? Uh, yeah. There might be that most of the effect is from the process of living daily life therapy for six months. Uh, not, and that may be interfering with the exercise variable. So there are all these things that we need to think about that we need to tease out to the best of our ability as we do research. But we still got to do it. We've got to do research. We've got to get it out there. 
in that way. And, uh, we can uh, get some objective uh, evidence as to why some things are working. Stuff that we know intuitively. Uh, stuff that we need to bring to, say, conferences and other venues uh, for validating the approach. Because you get people asking all the time, where's the research? Where's the research? See the research. So we see uh, physical activity, We've got emotional regulation, uh, the music program here is great to help with that, the art program, vocational ed, it's a big piece, transition. A lot of good work here that gets done with transition. When does transition to adulthood start, anyways? So, Legally, well, on paper in the IEP. Well, on paper is one thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the curriculum in high school. Uh, I think that's way too late to start. I think it happens the whole time. Like I have my kids doing chores in the classroom, and that's preparing them. But they're in middle school, school uh -huh. and I mean, I know teachers in elementary school. So that's preparing them. In a way for adult ones. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It starts early. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. So involvement in the community helps. And the way I look at transition, the federally mandated age for beginning transition planning is 16. In some states, they back it down to 14. And I think those numbers are really good if you chop the one off. Right. Transition starts as soon as you know somebody has autism. Doesn't mean you planned out their entire adult life, but you are going to start looking at uh, what are their interests, what are their strengths, what do they like to do, what can we start teaching them at a young age, like what's being done here in terms of chores, keeping things clean, all of these things that you're supposed to do, that you need to do as adults. And I think it's important to understand the transition. Uh, begins really early. So the other components of daily life therapy, uh, hopefully this is valid for describing daily life therapy. This is what I've brought along to five continents so far. <laughs> so hopefully I'm appropriately representing daily life therapy. And soon uh, we'll have a documentary that will be uh, somewhat similar in style to the two that you already saw. So uh, instead of uh, playing a 37 second clip of kids jumping around with pogo sticks, uh, show people uh, what is happening uh, with daily life therapy. So uh, that's a work in progress. Now, as we move from the behavioral approaches, uh, we're now entering the land of developmental approaches. So getting away from the uh, discussion of uh, behavior, modifying behavior, now the question is, how does the person with autism perceive the environment? What, is, what are the developmental gaps in the individual with autism? And this is what we're looking at in the uh, developmental approaches, in this case, developmental cognitive. So in other words, how does the person with autism think? How do they perceive the world? And the Miller method focuses on that uh, through the concept of the system. And the system is defined as an organized unit of behavior from object, person, event, or an idea. <laughs> Here's a system. It's a disrupted system. So the idea is disrupting the system. What's wrong with the stop sign? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's close enough to being a stop sign that you're familiar with, so you know exactly what to do when you see it. But you also notice the differences. So what we're seeing here is an example 
of some mild disruption of a system. And the idea is that if you disrupt a system, it's going to increase the probability that some learning or communication is going to take place. So another example of a disrupted system, how many of you notice when a picture is hanging crooked? How many of you does it bother? Like distracts you. How many of you would have to go and fix that crooked picture? If it was hanging on the wall. <laughs> so that's the concept of a system. Now what about in a uh, clinical situation? Let's take an example of a system here called the step slide system. And the nature of this system is that it's a repetitive behavior. All of them are. And you would teach this child this behavior, a series of behaviors. Walking up a flight of stairs, turning around, sitting down, sliding down, getting up and walking to, back to the stairs. And in the process, yeah, this would be done with a child who has limited verbal ability or maybe no verbal ability. Practitioners would narrate what they're doing. So and use sign language. So we would be saying, Yen climbs up the stairs. And they're like, yeah, no, she climbs up the stairs and sits down. They use sign language. And after, after he sits down, how many of you would say, good job, after he sat down? Now, the curious thing about the Miller method, the practitioners don't use the word, good job. Just don't use it. But they use narration. As an man is sitting down, they get styled and excited like a sportscaster. So what might be a reason behind eliminating good job? It doesn't describe the student what they actually do. Okay, it doesn't describe exactly what is being done. It also forces you to mix up your reinforcement or use other words rather than just Continuously saying, good job, good job, good job. All right, so uh, using other reinforcements. It interrupts the narration. It interrupts the narration. It might reinforce you to stop. And it looks like you're teaching the kid. Please. Right. Steps. Right, so a student might have learned that good job means that you can stop doing whatever you're doing. Probably something that you don't really like doing, so uh, now you can stop it. As we think about what good job means, what does it mean? Very ambiguous. It's ambiguous. It's abstract. So people with autism tend to live in the here and now. So a good job doesn't really have any meaning. How many of you have seen students engaging in an activity and muttering good job to themselves? Well, that happens too. And if that's the case, then why not use the language of the activity and attach that to the activity? So you might, instead of saying, good job, as the person sits down, and the person says, Ben is sitting down. It still sounds a little strange, but at least it's related to the activity. And that the idea is that the words get attached to the activity, the words that are meaningful. So then the, so then Anne goes down the slide, she gets up, and she walks back to the stairs. And then what a Miller Method practitioner would do is interrupt this system at a place of what is known as maximal tension. So maximal tension, where would the place of maximal tension be in this system? Uh, at the slot. And especially when you've sat down, but what is the strongest point of the system? Or another way to look at it, where is the greatest likelihood to get a meltdown or a tantrum on the child if you suddenly stop the child doing what they wanted to do. Yeah, they sat down, they've hitched forward, they're ready to go, and then a middle practitioner put their hand right in front of the child's chest and say, stop. <laughs> what would happen? Yeah, I want to go. Yeah, and then immediately let the child go. Now you're probably not going to get a, I want to go, from a child who's limited or no verbal ability. But you might get one of these, because that's what you've been doing all the time. Or you might get a duh, an approximation, or maybe the word. 
and then immediately. They're kicking your heels. Yeah, right. As soon as you get this approximation of communication, you send the child down the slide and you do it again. And what that does is teach the concept of functional communication, which is the concept of functional communication. And by considering how the person with autism thinks, practitioners of the Miller method uh, work to achieve developmental gains. So here's the Miller method. And like with the others, let's take a look at what seems to be emphasized in the Miller method. And what are some differences and similarities from the others that you saw? you see in the Miller method? What seemed to be emphasized? So it's more physical, all right? And it definitely is. Earlier I spoke about the importance of body to environmental relationship, and that's something that is emphasized in the Miller method. What else did you see? Initiation. Initiation, and what do you mean by that? Okay, so 
helping the child to lead or initiate? There's a lot more verbal fairness in aesthetic than verbal fairness visual. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of verbal is kinesthetic, so we're getting back to that body to environmental <coughs> relationships. It was one on one in the video. I don't know specifically if I'm like that, but two teachers for one student. Yeah, it was, yeah. That yeah, doesn't always run that way. There are millimetric classrooms. Uh, that's what you saw in there. Well, what physical interaction between teacher and student? Okay, a lot of physical, physical yeah. interaction. It's right. It's a lot more energetic. Yeah, it is very energetic. Yeah. Let me see data chart for some of the things around. Uh huh. It kind of like prompted. All right, so there so are no stimmy things for him to do. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's right, yeah. So what you saw were uh, you didn't see any reinforcements or uh, extrinsic reinforcements. And you would never see an extrinsic uh, reinforcer in pure millimeter. It's all intrinsic. So you're right about that. And when you're talking about stimmy activities, uh, you saw one activity where there was this board with holes cut out in it that the child would walk over and push balloons through those holes. And all of that is intrinsically rewarding. And that's what's meant by intrinsic rewards. Yeah, they tend to have fun. Now, occupational therapists like the villain method because there is so much occupational therapy type stuff. Uh, that is going on. So let's take an example. Uh, you have a child who is fascinated with balls. If they see a ball, they'll grab it. It's anywhere in the room. Even, even if you didn't know there was a ball in the room, the child would find it, even if it was in a box. I had a kid like that who I worked with. And while he didn't grab he, his fascination was balls. And somehow, he found two phones in my basement that were in a closed box. He just knew they were there, and he pulled up. And he'd take them out, and he'd ask me all kinds of questions about my phones. And, uh, where were they, and were they in the apartment before I lived in the house? Uh, what phone did I have as a child? Uh, he just enjoyed them. He'd pull them out, and they'd be there on the table while we were doing our music lessons. Uh, so anyways, let us suppose you have a kid who's focused, his focus is on balls. He sees a ball, he just grabs it right away. And in the process, his focus goes to the ball and not to what you want to do. So how would you work with such a child? How would you establish a connection with this child? Or you could teach them. Oh, okay. Usually he finds the balls anywhere, even if he hides them in mm -hmm. boxes. And it was hard for us to separate him from that, because he did be attracted to it any, in any building or any place in the school that we went to. Um, what we did was we slowly broke him away by playing with him. So mm -hmm. we kind of used a little bit of this method. We played with him, and then we eventually told him, once you go through your routine in your day, if we have time, we can use this as something that, not a reward, but something that may be more important. And now we're excelling him to the point where he's able to play with other students. That's great. So he used the ball as a play tool. Like he played by himself. Uh -huh. um, but he did kind of engage in adults. So the adults had the skill to throw it back to him. <laughs> right. Whereas the other kids, they didn't have the same interest. Uh -huh. He actually got a lot of other children in the class to play on a reciprocal game. Right. And now he's using other parts of his body. He would never kick it. Uh -huh. Now his kick is phenomenal. He could be a soccer player. It's right. That's oh, great. <laughs> All right. So you've got a ball kid. He had a child. Um, he used a lot of pieces of glasses. He was obsessed with helicopters. Uh huh. So those were after counted the helicopters. Right. Um, it was a different picture. He cared. Also, he'd count the helicopters. <laughs> right. They're so making all this stuff intrinsically rewarding, and you're using the ball to develop interaction, uh, as opposed to uh, another, perhaps more behavioral approach, which would say you got to clear the place of balls, 
and we've got to get the student to sit down and attend and to look at me. And then if he's good, he can play with the ball. So uh, that's good. It's good to be working with the interests. And that way we'll get a lot further. The examples you gave me uh, clearly show that. Other methods, a lot of similar things. There's a lot of similarities with that. A lot of times um, we use repetitive systems mm -hmm. to interrupt the system. We find when the student can predict the next piece, starts to initiate the next piece, that their world of awareness is very focused. Right. And then you can get them to do other things in that narrow space mm -hmm. where they're very focused. And then the schedule the routine of a small activity, a big class activity, because it's a whole day, those predictable pieces. It's almost like um, you see Mary had a little lamb three times and lean on the lamb. Yeah. yeah, well, that's a disrupted system. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what it is. And everybody's done it. You've all done it. Uh, whenever you've left the last piece out of a song, uh, whenever you've intentionally, intentionally stopped doing something and waited for the child to fill in, that's a disrupted system. Uh, really just put terminology to it. And did a lot of research and uh, built a whole approach around the idea of the disrupted system. So it's, uh, in helping individuals with autism, it's really a matter of seeing what's out there, what techniques there are, and then finding ways to use them to best help that individual. So as we roll along to other approaches, we've also got developmental individual difference relation-based intervention. How many of you have heard of that one? How many of you have heard of floor time? Just call it floor time. That's what it is. <laughs> Nobody can remember that. Uh, sometimes it's called DIR, for sure. And we're still in the, develop, the developmental uh, category of interventions, whereas Miller was, de was developmental cognitive. Other people with autism think. Now it's how do people with autism feel? and process relationships. So with this approach, the focus is on what interests the child. So as we look at this uh, activity, uh, we'll see that the focus is on developing circles of communication. I'm not sure why they call them circles, because communication tends to be lines straight back and forth between people, but they call them circles. So back and forth communication, this case between the child's mother and the child, and let's take a look at the object that seems to be of particular interest. So the focus is on the crown and putting it on his mother, and then Dr. Greenspan is going to try to expand that activity to include a doll. But he seems to be stuck on having his mother wear the crown. The doll just doesn't have any interest for the child. But he is interested in Dr. Greenspan. <laughs> he wants it back. He's trying to get the child to say, I want it back. But a crown, please. But that's still a little bit too complicated for him. And he's protesting, so he simplifies it to, if you say mine, you can get the crown back. He said mine, and he gets the crown.
So the key was to join him in the activity. As you were talking about joining the child uh, with the ball that you were talking about, in his activities of the ball, you join the activity. You join the child in the activity of interest. And in that way, educate the child. You take DIR and you put it in the blender and you get RDI. <laughs> How many of you have heard of RDI? Another developmental affective approach. Uh, you can think of it as a uh, spin-off of the Miller method. And the reason why I say that is that developer Stephen Goodstein attended a workshop uh, delivered by Arnold Miller and was so impressed with it that he took the approach and you might say he took a left turn at Albuquerque <laughs> and did his own thing with it. And the idea is uh, to build dynamic intelligence. People with autism are, can be pretty good with static intelligence, facts and figures. Uh, what about when things change dynamically as they do in relationships? So the idea is to move from instrumental to experience sharing relationships. Instrumental relationships. Those are relationships that have an end goal. They have a specific purpose, you meet the purpose, then you're all done. That's the relationship you have with a cashier, the gas station attendant, and then the person who fixes your car. You go for a specific reason, accomplish the goal, that's it. Then there's the experience sharing relationships. The experience sharing relationships are the ones that friendships are made of. So in other words, uh, this is the person you go to with a movie, you enjoy the movie, maybe you have dinner afterwards, go home, uh, the friendship's not over, but it continues. And you may have to teach the idea of co-regulation, perhaps first on the physical level. So let's try something. Do I have a volunteer? Miko has volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just going to walk back and forth. Try not to trip over anything. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, what did you learn today? A lot. A lot. <laughs> I can say the word. <laughs> so, you're non verbal. Did you feel like you were uh, overstimmed by the activity? Um, yeah. No. <laughs> Doing some very good physical co regulation. <laughs> very good physical co regulation. <laughs> so, what I do is I uh, see how Miko's walking with me, and when I turn around, she turns around. And I can get her to walk around in a circle. <laughs> she has no idea what we're doing, what we're doing. All right, you did some great co regulation. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you know have kids with autism here who kind of spin off ahead or behind or off to the side? And what that might suggest is that they haven't quite figured out what physical co regulation is. Most adults have figured it out. Nico has figured it out really well. Uh, too well for our situation. And uh, she followed me. She stopped when I stopped. She spun around when I spun around. I even got her to turn around in a circle. We have bonded. Yeah, we bonded, yeah. And it's this bonding or co regulation that you might have to teach on a physical level first before you can move on to emotional and intellectual co regulation. And again, this is something that we tend to take for granted. Uh, we might have to provide direct instruction for someone on the autism spectrum. So getting those kids out there and running around the school in the morning, uh, that's a good example of developing co-regulation on the physical level. It's then permits you to move to the emotional and intellectual levels. So that's something that they focus on in RDI.
Then we have certs, sometimes mispronounced as skirts. It's certs. And the focus of certs is to consider these three areas of functioning. Social communication, emotional regulation, and transactional support. <coughs> so teaching skills in joint attention. What is joint attention, by the way? Okay, so that's what it is. So it's more than just two people looking at or doing the same thing. But there's an awareness between those two people that you're both looking at it, or you're both doing it. So you may have two kids playing in a sandbox and doing very similar things, but if they're unaware of, what they're, of each other, then that's not joint attention. Joint attention is what's involved in following a point, and you know that many children with autism have difficulty with that. I know often I have difficulty following the point. So for example, what I'm in a, in the airport, and I ask somebody where, for directions, they'll point. But to me, it seems, what I perceive, or at least the, the usefulness I get out of their point, is if you were to say, well, it's over there. <laughs> so it just doesn't work. And then I have to ask them some clarifying questions. So you mean it's, it's next to this or whatever. How many doors down? Then I can find it. So that's joint attention, use of symbols for communication. Uh, we talked a little bit about emotional regulation, whether it's the regulation of oneself or with others, a recovery from dysregulation. And then finally, transactional supports, interacting with others. So what is new here uh, from what you've seen so far in the different approaches? Right, we haven't talked about joint attention, but people do talk about it. And All right, so there's other people involved. More focused than just the individual. Uh, trend, uh, interacting with others. And the thing is with uh, certs is that it's not really an approach. It's more like I'm not even sure what you call it, maybe a philosophy. So the idea behind certs is that you do a really good assessment of the child's needs. And then you pull in techniques from all the other approaches. It could be daily life therapy, it could be teach, it could be Miller Method, it could be ABA, it could be something else. And using all of these little pieces, you put together a program that best meets the needs of the individual. And that's what CERTS is about. And what are we all about? We're about building success for people with autism. Helping people with autism be productive and fulfilled with whatever they do. And they move through their journeys in life from goal to goal, to activity to activity. Uh, just as we move through our lives activity from goal to goal and I think one thing that's important is to keep in mind what we're looking for in those students uh, with autism who serve and the idea that we're working with individuals uh, sometimes I see people uh, focusing too much on what other people are doing that my child didn't do this, but somebody else's child did. Really what we're looking at, if you want to talk about research, are ends of one. Multiple ends of one. And if we can get a child with autism to better understand their environment, to better understand themselves, self-regulation, mutual regulation, communication with others, routines, if they can learn a little bit more about how to do these things and be successful at the end of a class session, at the end of a day, at the end of a semester, then I call that a success. Just because we're all here, if you've learned more about autism, if you know more about autism now than you knew when you started at the beginning, then 
all of you being here is a success as well. And exactly where you need to be. So thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? We went through a lot of stuff. You're welcome. Yeah, there was no mention of pharmacological intervention. There was very little bit. Yeah, was. And all I said about uh, pharmacological information, uh, about uh, treatment, is that uh, there is no medicine for autism. Uh, you can't cure autism or change the basic characteristics of autism. You might be able to use medicine to address some of the challenges that go with autism, like someone who may have excess anxiety, or someone who may have some food intolerances, or immune system issues, or other medical issues. And the way I look at medicine and autism is that anybody with autism who has a medical issue, you treat it as a medical issue. And it's no more and no less. And when you start using medicine to cure autism, then you get into all kinds of problems. <laughs> so if somebody with autism has a cold, they're big. <laughs> <laughs> they some aspirin. <laughs> That's what I would want. Cold flu. Yeah. Cold flu. Cold flu. Yeah. Cold flu. Well, the way I look at it, medicine and autism doesn't have to be that complicated. Or I should say it's as complicated as medicine is for everybody else. And there are some things that tend to happen more in those with autism than in the general population, especially related to digestion and immune systems. And that's why we have some doctors who are focusing on these areas, uh, people with autism. So really what should uh, be happening in the medical field is just the practice of good medicine. It's like in the educational field, right? we're in the practice of good education, whether that's for people with autism, whether it's people who don't have autism, and in particular, when uh, we look at daily life therapy, it appears to be the only approach, it's the only one I've found, that's used with both the typical and autistic population. Uh, the others can probably be used with both, but nobody's ever done it. Now, there is a school in India, uh, where I was for the past 10 days or so, uh, that is a combination uh, Montessori and quickly becoming a Miller Method school. And they are about well, split 50-50. Half regular ed, half special ed. Most of the special ed students uh, have autism. There's some other conditions in there as well. And they all get piled in together and they get taught together. So that's interesting to see. So good education is good education, uh, whatever it is. And when I talk about accommodations, and if we look into accommodations in the inclusion settings, uh, they're really just extensions of good teaching practice. If we look at uh, what's being done. So an individual, for example, I think of an individual with autism I had. Uh, actually, uh, some of you know him. David DiLorenzo. <laughs> so somehow he, he ended up in my computer class that I taught at Bunker Hill some years ago. And the, the accommodation for him was to have an advanced organizer for the class, for the class. Which is just a fancy word of saying agenda. I don't know why they actually use that word. <laughs> just give him an agenda. That is, when you think about it, might that agenda be helpful for the rest of the class? So shouldn't everybody get the agenda? Or shouldn't it be up on the wall or the board? Should I spend some time before class saying we're going to do a one, two, three, four, five? That's the day's class. Or in, a, in an inclusion or any type of setting, uh, what about having a schedule on the wall, on a bulletin board? And spending time, as I see a lot of teachers do, at the beginning of the day, be it special ed, be it regular ed, this is our schedule for today. Suppose there's a change in the schedule. Uh, 
like, instead of math, we now have a school assembly. And what I might do for the person with autism is ask them, I might say, uh, Yumiko, would you be the, uh, would you be the uh, schedule monitor? And your job would be to take this card that says school assembly and paste it right on top of the math class for today. And what that does is get the person with autism, someone who might need a little bit of extra, a um, little bit of an extra boost to work, that the uh, transition gives them a physical representation of that transition, and that may be enough. So that everybody benefits from the same education. So I think that's something that also needs to be explored further in depth. It's uh, exactly how looking at what is making daily life therapy successful as an approach being used for uh, the autistic and regular education population. You know, I was trying to argue that. We, we um, submitted something to YAI uh, conference that we didn't get. Uh, we went to, we to give it a regular conference, but one of the premises of the paper we were writing was that if regular education teachers used, instead of charts and graphs mm -hmm. or um, in a classroom to manage the behavior of autistic children, used a schedule and the organizations in the classroom where they really did what we did and broke down each lesson and let children know what was happening and what was coming and included autistic children within the classroom with a great deal of structure and organizational support and used raising your hand and that same kind of structure right. to manage autistic children within the classroom. But they could do away with a lot of the tangible rewards and having these star charts for kids mm -hmm. that differentiated them right. and took them out of the mainstream and out of the norm. That I think a lot of autistic kids would be much more successful within the classrooms than they are now where they are um, separated from their peers and made to look different from their peers mm -hmm. um, and um, stigmatized the way they are and managed differently. And I think that they could be managed much better within a classroom if they were treated the way their peers are treated, but if these techniques that we use are used within the classroom to manage them by, by the teachers being much better organized and allowing the children that would be much better organized to understand classroom systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Good teaching is good teaching where, wherever it happens. And it would be interesting to see the uh, effect of daily life therapy on the special education population at large. Well, it's interesting, Stephen, though. There's a comment. My wife's an educator here, and she, she brought this comment out that one of the ways we do our best as a human being is to do your best for others. So when I was a child, I did my best for my parents. That's the point. And then when you're in high school or college, you end up doing your best for your significant other in your relationship. And then when you have your own children, you do your best for your own children. All of a sudden, or you do your best for your employer. Yep. All of a sudden, you hit 70 or 80, and children have moved out, and your spouse dies. You feel extremely lonely, and you're expected to be able to cope on your own. Mm -hmm. You see a great deal of depression in elderly people. So then we almost do that to our children because we expect them to turn 22 and be independent. Right. I've never been independent. <laughs> I've always been, oh, my mom's going to kill me, oh, my wife's going to kill me, my kids are going to be disappointed. And as soon as that's gone, I don't think I can function. So when we expect our children to do something we don't, if we expect them to graduate, not be married, mm -hmm. not have children. And if we tell them what to do, a 22-year-old uh, program, I work in adult services, if I told them what to do, I should violate their human rights. Uh, my children, my wife, and my coworkers violate human rights all day long. If that's if that's the <laughs> definition of violating human rights, telling someone what to do. Yeah. So that whole talk service area becomes very it's unknown. I feel like our children, the 
without without marriages and without having their own children, that we almost have to provide that healthy tension for who you invest with someone else. Yeah, I see what you mean. What you're talking about is you mentioned the word independence. Mm. And really what we're looking at is appropriate interdependence. Mm. Right. And if we look at it that way, uh, then we get this perseveration off we get off this perseveration of independence because that's not what we're looking for anyways. And talking about independence, the way we talk about it, uh, you almost uh, might think you, you should be ashamed of sitting in the chair that you're sitting in because you didn't build it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.